That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Whale, the eighth film directed by Darren Aronofsky, uh, which competed at the 2022 Venice Film Festival uh, and is being released courtesy of A24 on December 9th, 2022. Have I seen a Darren Aronofsky film? Yeah, you've seen a few. Name uh, them. Well, Requiem for a Dream, his sophomore film. You have seen that film with Ellen Burstyn. Mm, Jared I don't think Leto. So. You I, I know of it. Well, we need to fix that immediately because that's a great film. Uh, the Fountain, Black Swan. Uh, I'm sure you didn't see Noah or his last film, Mother. Uh, but The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke, which I feel like that film has a lot of very interesting similarities with The Whale. Okay. The base, this movie is based on a play by Samuel D. Hunter, uh, who over the past decade has uh, risen to uh, great renown, and he adapted his own screenplay, and this is apparently 10 years in the making, because that's when Aronofsky purchased the rights. I thought this movie was good enough, mainly, primarily because of Brendan Fraser's performance. Yes, uh, it gives that kind of comeback performance, much like Mickey Rourke in The Wrestler. Uh, I do think he is impressive, and I, I, the by far, I think the best part of it. Um, but I'm going to say what I said after we finished it, which I know people won't like, but I thought this movie felt like if Tyler Perry had to make a serious movie about one of the people from My 600 Pound Life, it would feel like this movie. I think you're, <laughs> I think you're selling short some of the great character work and some of some good dialogue that might feel really overworked. I think uh, it's better than what Mr. Perry can do. I, I think as a writer. Sure, but it's it's a little melodramatic. It is. And it, some of those performances are over the top. It, it is. It's doing the most, and I almost wonder if um, somebody else had come in to adapt and kind of. I, it it feels like a film where some more darlings needed to be killed, if that makes sense. Okay, the basic story is there's a guy named Charlie. Yes. Played by Brendan Fraser. We find him, like, he's like 600 pounds, uh, sort of, what's the word? When you're stuck, he's stuck in this house. He's immobile. Um, he's a college professor. He teaches English comp uh, remotely. And of note, while he's on camera, he pretends his web webcam is broken so that it's always dark. Um, we find out that he used to be married to a lady and had a kid. And when the kid was maybe like eight years old, he left his wife and his kid to be with a man. So Charlie's gay. And the man he was with ended up committing suicide because he was conflicted with his religious beliefs. And it was his lover suicide that drove him to um pack on the pounds and so that's why we find where we find him today and today is like 2016 right before the election presidential election a key character is his best friend liz who is a nurse she's also the sister of his dead partner mm -hmm. So she comes to see him. She enables him by bringing him crazy food, but she also takes care of him because he will not go see a doctor. And we find out right away that he is suffering from congestive heart failure and he's going to die like in a week. So the film is kind of set up like Monday through Friday. Which I don't think it needs to do. No. But I think like on the second day, his daughter, who he hasn't seen in like 10 years, just pops up because she's been suspended from school and had nothing better to do. I wasn't quite sure why she decided to pop up. Maybe the curiosity of getting to know her dad. And she had free time during the day. And we find out that she's about to... She's not going to graduate high school if she doesn't at least show improvement in one class. So she's telling her dad, like... He's saying to her, like, if you spend time with me and let me help you with your homework, I'll give you money. $120,000 to be precise. Mm -hmm. I've been saving it for you. And she begrudgingly agrees so we get a few days of her visiting him it's contentious there's also like this young man who's like a christian missionary thomas who, keep, who keeps coming to visit because he wants to help him who has secrets of his own he has secrets of his own we can get into but everything culminates with the daughter storming in like on friday like this essay you wrote for me, I failed. Like, are you trying to get me like to not graduate? And he's like, did you read the essay? So in the opening of the film, Charlie is like 
suffering from a panic attack and we see that he reads this essay i think he's having a heart a heart attack because he's masturbating to gay porn that's right um he's having like an issue and so to calm himself down he reads this like book report of moby dick and we revisit this report a couple of times and then at the end when he tells his daughter did you read what i gave you she's like no <laughs> well read it and it's that report and so as the audience, initially I thought, oh, it must be something he wrote when he was younger because it doesn't sound like, it sounds like a kid wrote it. Mm -hmm. We find out that that's a book report his daughter wrote like four years ago that the mom had given him. And for some reason he's fixated on it. And that's what he uses to calm him down. And of course fits very conveniently with the subtext of... Like this creature and this, yeah. Ahab. The symbolism is very heavy. Yes. So and the queerness because you know and it it references two of uh, American literature's most notable writers that were also gay Whitman and Melville. So as the daughter's reading it, is she sort of coming around because his goal was to sort of make his daughter believe that she's a special person and that she will amount to something in life that people will like her. So as she's reading it, she's getting emotional, and then I, but what I thought was really <laughs> dramatic is we see. Charlie get up and of course he's you know not the most ambulatory so it's like it, it looks like this creature rising from the depths and he walks over to her and then the final shot is him being like like levitating from the ground towards a white light and then we see like a memory of his at the beach with his daughter the end so I assume that he died we were at a screening where there was a Q&A afterwards and Brendan Fraser thought that he lives. He said he'd like to believe that Charlie lives. But... Because it's... In his mind, it's open to interpretation. I, I suppose technically it is because we're not seeing him die. But I th feel like the metaphor of him... that Because this play is all about redemption and salvation. And it, it's at that moment that he meets it. It's... You know, this whole... Um, it was shot by, of course, Aronofsky's usual uh, cinematographer, Matthew Libatik. Uh, and, of course, uh, based on a play that's set in one apartment... Uh, it's set mostly in there, but outside we get a lot of what's going on in the weather patterns, right? It's rainy and dark and dreary. And the finale is right where we see the sun break through the horizon and where Ellie, played by Sadie Sink, calls him daddy. And, you know, he's reached that moment where he can now move on to the next realm. What did I like? Brendan Fraser's performance. I also liked how the film was shot. We're stuck in this, you know, smallish... They say it's an apartment, but it, it looks like a house. So I was surprised because it has a porch and... It's a two-bedroom. You see some exterior shots because yeah, it's on the second floor. Yeah. But, I mean, they make the most of it. And during the Q&A, they discuss like how they chose to put the couch in the middle of the living room. So the, the camera work sort of circles him. And I thought was super effective. Um, the actor playing Liz, Charlie's best friend... Hong Chow. Who I know from... Probably driveways, but driveways. Uh, she's probably best known for Alexander Payne's downsizing because she's the scene stealer in that movie. I liked her character. Yes. But two things, I think. One, there is a show called My 600 Pound Life with like 130 plus episodes, and I've seen all of them, I think. So this to me felt like an episode of My 600, like all the things you would see in that episode is in this movie. And so whenever like I watch it with other people, there's always this question of, like the enablers around them and why they do it. And I thought the better story would have been to focus on Liz and why she's there for Charlie. And it is explained, I mean, it's obvious that like she has a connection to Charlie because of her dead brother. She has a warmth towards him, but we really don't know much else about her. Like, does she have friends? Does she have a love life? Um, how does she reconcile... Staying in Idaho. Well, not only staying in Idaho when she could easily leave, but also like... She's killing Charlie by feeding him Subway sandwiches or it's, meatball sandwiches and buckets of fried it, chicken. It's that nexus of um, what, uh, what, harm reduction almost. He's at a point because she knows he's going to die. You're so, right. I, so I think, you know, you, we can let her off the hook a little bit this this week. Oh, no. Uh, but yes, that, that nexus of being a, a supporter and an enabler because at this point I feel like she's trying to comfort him. I don't but. see her as a villain. I just think that she's more interesting and I, I, I would have been more interested in learning about her and how this figure has become such a prominent part of her life and how it's affected her. Because as it is, I feel like if you've watched My 600 Pound Life, this story is not that... I mean, it's... 
It just didn't send me anywhere. No, but even watching it a second time, there are moments that I think are, there are moments where I think feel kind of uh, a, a little overly, as I said, manufactured, like maybe we need to step back from the material and cut some things out. Uh, where, but there are moments of great poignancy and they're usually between Fraser and uh, Hong Chao. I thought the one moment that really stuck out to me was when the daughter, of course, is, I mean, it feels like, the daughter feels like an after school special. She's she's off. She's vile. She's manipulative. She's she's manic manipulative in kind of a Gilmore Girls fashion. It's too much. Yeah. But there is a moment when she's just arguing with him, like, "You weren't there for me. Why didn't you try?" And Charlie says to her, "Who would want me to be a part of their life?" That was the one line that I thought, like, "Oh." Oh no, Hong Chao has a few really good lines about, like, "How can you do this to me again?" I watched, had to watch. Oh yes. Mother die. There's a there are moments of like considerable anguish. I think. I love Samantha Morton. I think she's a fantastic actress and she brings kind of this weird energy that the is, mom. Yeah. That's really as Mary is really disjointed feeling from the rest of the film. But the, the, the culmination of their scene works really well too, where he's screaming, you know, I want, I need to know that I've done one thing with my life and there, there, his expression and movement and performance. I think that that's a really fine moment. Yeah. I, I think Liz as a whole was probably my favorite part of the film. So I agree with her, but I think just, from what Charlie was saying, and I, I think the mom brought an interesting sort of turn when she does arrive at the end of the film, but I thought some of that performance felt a little. I don't know. It also maybe doesn't help that I know it's based on a play because then I feel it kind of feels like a play and that they're really being dramatic about everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, there's nothing wrong. Sadie Sink, I think, as a screen presence, is fine. But she is so cruel and over the top. It it becomes camp at, at certain points. It's like this is this is kind of delving into camp territory when I should be feeling kind of the the um, emotional turmoil. I thought a really good scene and probably one that had the vibe of what I was looking for is uh, at one point Liz brings Charlie like a meatball sub and he chokes on it. Mm -hmm. So she has to like use her medical knowledge to like help him. And then she gets very upset afterwards, which you alluded to. That was really, I think, more of what I wanted. Like, their relationship. I, I, I just really didn't like this dog. Well, and they're haunted by the specter of this this dead man, his his boyfriend that he wasn't able to be with because they weren't legally married when he died. And yeah. all of that anguish. His name was Alan Grant? Yeah, because at the moment... Isn't that the name of Sam Neill in Jurassic Park? Oh, well, I don't know. But yes, he. that's a good moment too where Liz is telling him like, you weren't the one who had to go identify his body. And then Charlie says, because they wouldn't let me. Like, I wasn't family. And then the look on her face of like, okay, you're right, let me calm down. Again, I thought that worked really well. Like, those two together. And then there's the addition from the play, what's new here is the this pizza guy that's delivering pizzas on the porch all the time that kind of uh, triggers a binging uh, sequence. Which I thought was a lot because he, this Gambino's pizza guy visits three times and then he says like, hey, like my name's Dan, like who are you? I come all the time, thought you might want to know who I am. So finally at the end, like at the fourth visit, I believe, Charlie goes out to grab his pizza and Dan has been waiting to see him. And when, and Dan is like this thin guy and when he sees Charlie, it's clear he's disgusted and runs off. That felt very extra to me. Like, we spent a lot of time with this Gambino's guy for him to just be like, ew, gross, and scurry off. I know, and, and you know, showing how there's, are there limitations to people's empathy, right? Because he, Charlie, somebody that exists so far outside of the norm, supposedly. And uh, same with the look of horror when he does finally reveal himself to his students. It's yes, like, that feels a lot, like, like a lot. Y'all are trash. Like, you, also, you, you're on cam, you can't just... You have to have, like, a visible... <laughs> yeah. Then, I know. I, I know there was criticism of this movie being, like, exploitative, people felt. I, I, I don't know what it would be. There is a binging scene where after the Gambino's guy runs off, Charlie gets upset and, like, devours. Two, he eats everything in the kitchen. And there's a point where he makes, like, a sandwich out of white Wonder Bread. It looks like Cheetos. Mm -hmm. And then he pours, like, grape jelly on top. That took me out, but... And then, of course, he gets sick. You know, I mean, I, 
I, I don't know what people think is exploitive about it. I mean, this is someone's story. And... Well, yeah, and I think that's why A24 is trying to come out a little ahead of that with uh, the release, the, the way it's being released and, you know, very piecemeal. We don't we haven't seen a lot of images and stills of this movie released yet either. Uh, but the, the screenwriter coming out and saying, you know, how a lot of this was... Uh, taken from his own life, a little, a, you know, some of these details and and how, you know, of course this isn't meant to be uh, exploitive in any. Charlie sense. also doesn't look that big to me compared to some people I've seen. No. Yeah, I mean, he's Charlie is overweight. I mean, like morbidly obese, but like if you because they never actually say his weight. I feel like I just read in like the news that he's supposed to be like six hundred pounds, but he doesn't. He's He's very, he seems very tall, so he just seems like a very large figure, but I don't think, like, the, the, uh, like, practical effects are, like, over the top. Well, or... he's in a suit. He's in, he's in a very complicated kind of uh, we, apparatus to move around. Yeah, like. we see him, like, nude, but, I mean, as nude as he can be, and, like, I thought it looked, like, natural, mm -hmm. of just this big, tall guy who's very overweight. It didn't look, like, out of a horror film. Um... There's a scene where Liz, the nurse, his friend, brings him a wheelchair. And that was... A very limited moment of levity. Yes, because he seems excited that he can be more mobile. But then he's restricted because his home is kind of a mess, except for the bedroom he shared with his partner. It's been kept pristine because he doesn't go in there. And then the wheelchair is too big to get him in. Um... We didn't really talk about the missionary kid. Uh, which is my least favorite character, and it feels a bit too convenient, much like uh, this time frame starting off on a Monday. So, you know, by the time we get Friday to flash on the screen, you know, this is the end. And what, you know, why can't his descent start on a Wednesday or a Saturday? Uh, and T Simpkins, as Ty Thomas, feels very convenient, much like Sadie Sink just showing up. She happened to be suspended the last year of her father's life and in instigating that. Uh, Shows up while he's masturbating, and uh, the, the backstory on him also seems mm, like There's it, just a lot. It like he had stolen some. He'd stolen the uh, tithing, the, the, tithe, the church money, the from, church money from this like strange kind of cult religion that he. So the, he fled he, out of state yes. to where? Because they're in Idaho. They're in Idaho, and he's from Iowa. Right. And uh, Ellie gets him stoned, and he reveals all this stuff about his himself what she records and, and but this is why i'm saying it kind of feels like a tyler perry production because they're throwing everything at it like the mom sadie's mom or what's the ellie her mom is like a drug like has issues with drugs and alcohol this kid was stealing fled and then we find out that the missionary kid he's really not a missionary he's pretending mm -hmm. and we never really get a sense of what his intention was with charlie he does say he just wanted to help him but then I also got a moment of like, was he trying to steal from Charlie? Like I got that sense, but it never is. I, I it, yeah, right. Uh, I, I don't understand, or maybe in my worldview, just doesn't make sense. Like, so you're gonna you're gonna save this one soul, and that's gonna you're gonna have um, that's your expiation. Well, I, you I still know. need money, so I don't understand. Right, right. like you, you still gotta get home somewhere. And I, then when he finally comes clean to Charlie, it's because he opens up to. Ellie, the daughter, and set, and tells his story. That's how we know that he used to belong to a church, stole $2,400, and then fled to Idaho. And Ellie is recording him and taking pictures of him. And he keeps saying, I wish you wouldn't take pictures of me, like smoking weed and doing all this shit. And this, that girl contacts his parents, mm -hmm. sends them the audio, the pictures of what he's been doing, and the parents call him and say, it's okay, come home, we still love you. So... Her being like a snitch worked out for him. So he comes to tell Charlie. But then Charlie is trying to explain to him, like, I don't need your help. I'm gay. And then the missionary kid blows up on him. Like, you're disgusting. So it just... I don't really understand the purpose of this character. To Charlie. I, I think just another person in this mix of... Uh, this melange of people that are have are self-inflicted harm but are also good people that see the good in others and i i feel like it's along those lines but it just feels again a little bit overwrought and a bit a little bit too convenient and, and i wish it had felt a little more jagged around the edges such as even this you know 
I, I, I really don't like the essay and how it's used and how that is what's, you know... Because he yes, keeps saying it's like the best thing that was ever written, but it's clearly been written by like a seventh grader. But the <laughs> meaning of it being that I it was his yeah. kid that, that wrote and it. And she was being honest about what she read, which he keeps talking about over and over and again, he, like it's and, about being honest. And he's the whale and she's Captain Ahab and, you know, she's consumed in ra with rage and ruining her life over uh, this creature that has just been existing on its own. I would recommend this film because of Brendan Fraser. Again, and again, like The Wrestler, which is with Mickey Rourke as the wrestler who has uh, an estranged relationship with his daughter. Like, you know, this feels very much like something that Aronofsky's previously been attracted to. Um, you know, at the Q&A, he said that, that, you know, there's slight shade about how when they first considered Brendan Fraser, they were like, oh, I don't, we were, I'm not familiar with his past work. And it's like... Yeah, the director was kind of shady about Brendan Fraser. And then he said, and when I called the screenwriter to tell him about Brendan, he basically like hung up on me. Like, but, but damn. But it's like, Fraser, you know, Fraser has, you know, yes, a, a faded Hollywood matinee idol, right? But he also did indie work that was pretty strong. He was in Gods and Monsters about James Whale, the gay director, where he's the object of affection. You know, it's it's just interesting how we're so willing to dismiss people so easily but I, I do think Brendan Fraser is the best part of it I was surprised he didn't win best actor in Venice for this actually um, and it you know yeah it, I think he's the best part Hong Chao I think they both received Gotham Award nominations for this uh, over the past week but what would you give this movie three out of five I would give it three out of five as well anything else no hit the thanks button listen to our podcast bye Oh, 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 oh,